So we're going to talk about a really simple idea about leadership and the whole concept of leadership at any level. And when I say any level, so my job today is primarily to sort of bring a charge to Wes and Sarah, but really it's not. It's to bring it to everybody and it's pretty much impossible to go to the Bible and say this is a charge to two people and not to everybody else. So it's to all of you and it's to me equally as much. And simply... What we're saying is that in development of people and the leadership of a church, more than anything else, we need to be what we want to create. We need to be and become what we want to create. We have to live what we want others to live. We have to become the people that we hope others will become. And it's a leadership concept that's true whether you're leading a country, you're leading a business, you're leading a family, whatever it is you're doing, it applies. I remember years ago going to a leadership conference with a guy many of you will know. He was a very famous leadership guru. He had this little illustration about fleas. So, okay, I'm not saying you're fleas, but if you feel like it, just grab that idea. And he talked about fleas in a jar, and he had, all I remember, it's actually all I remember from two days of this conference, was him doing this stuff. Okay, this is the thing. If you put fleas in a jar and you put the lid on, this is what the fleas just keep on doing. But after a little while, you take the lid off it, and no fleas jump out. <laughs> they just jump as high as the lid. Now, there's other illustrations that do the same thing, teach the same idea. His point was that in leadership, people never go beyond the level of the leaders. That's as high as they go. And at any level, there's a degree, not a complete truth, but some truth to that. The president of Hyatt Hotels wrote that 99% of all employees want to do well, but how they perform is actually a reflection of the person they work for. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, every great institution is the length and shadow of a single man. Now, I don't agree with those completely, because we believe the Holy Spirit does far more than that and can do that in every one of us. And yet, I think we all, to some degree, believe that any organization is somewhat in the shadow of its leader. It makes a difference. And so, most importantly, what does Jesus say about that? And we're looking in Luke chapter 6, picking up in verse 37. We're just pulling out a section that sort of parallels somewhat the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is teaching in Matthew, but this is the one in Luke. Luke chapter 6, verse 37. And he talks about three different things, and we're just going to bring those around, that idea of becoming what you want to create. This is Jesus' words. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. We like that illustration. We kind of walked over it it'd be good to let it sit for a second and simmer. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. That's not a handy-dandy little axiom that you stick up in your kitchen. It's the words of Jesus. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And then he also told them this parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Really simple idea, simple reminder on a day when we're gathering for the installation of Wes as Reverend Wes Parker, pastor of Dunbar Church, let's celebrate it together, let's make a commitment together, let's make a pledge together. Here's the bottom line, Wes, regardless of whatever religious title you ever get, reverend or irreverend, whether you get the title pastor, whatever words you like to use for that, whether you get up here and you kneel down and get prayed for by the church, whether you are now the official lead pastor of Dunbar Church, what matters most to God is what's going on in your inner life. That's what matters most to God. 
and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. That's daunting words. That's scary words. Because spiritually speaking, we get back what we put in, and in leadership, we reproduce who we are. Spiritually, we get back what we're willing to put in. That's a pretty good slogan. It's not always exactly true. Again, it's true with any good slogan for us. We believe that we are saved by grace, not of ourselves. It's a work of God so that no one can boast. It's God's work, not ours. But we also believe that whatever a man sows, that also will he reap. And that spiritually, for every one of us in our own growth, and certainly for leaders, we do get back what we're willing to put in. In fact, Jesus talks about it. If you look at the last section of this well-known story, where he says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? You pay no attention to the plank in your own. How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you fail to see the one in your own? Spiritual growth, spiritual leadership demands personal honesty. And with a bit of humor in this passage, Luke plays around using the words of Jesus with the idea of a person who's criticizing other people for a speck. It's like you got something in your eye, there's something there, and you're making this accusation to them while they have a whole plank sticking out of their own eye. And of course, when you think of that, it's a dumb idea, an entire plank sticking out of the eye, which is on purpose. It's kind of Google image of the mind, if you will. It's a cartoon image. And he's using it on purpose, saying, why, why would you ever do that? And I hear it when he's using the word brother. I'm probably projecting when I do this, incidentally, that he's looking at that and he's been around religious people a whole lot. The kind who come up and, you know, they have the, sorry if I caricature this at all, they're wearing their polyester suit, they've got a bit of bro cream with a little flip on their head and they talk in pious language all the time and every time they come up to you, they lay their hand, brother, and you fade out. Once upon a time in my past, true story, I was in a restaurant, a guy came up to me, I won't say who, and brother, and started talking. After that, I don't remember anything until I drove into a post in the parking lot. I explained that to ICBC. I was driving under the influence of boredom, but it, it didn't sell. I still had to pay for the accident. Nevertheless, I have a feeling when I read this and he starts to talk about somebody comes up to you, hey, brother. It's difficult. Honesty, personal honesty, is difficult, and criticism of others is amazingly easy. And it ranges from heads of countries complaining about other people, criticizing one another, to people in a church arguing whether they do or don't like the songs that appear every Sunday, and so you didn't do enough hymns, or you did too many hymns, you did that song too fast or too fast, you changed the line, it like, goes on endlessly. It happens every week in every church. Let me say that again. It happens Okay, maybe, almost, every week in every church, it's like the Bible doesn't exist. <laughs> like what we're talking about here is a theory only. We never actually have to practice. We don't actually have to do this, take the speck out of our own eye before we pay attention to the plank in somebody else's. We throw planks around like anything. And these are verses that are primarily about how we deal with ourself. They're about self-awareness. Some of your leaders were at a seminar we did last weekend, and we talked a little bit about self-awareness. It comes from passages like this. If we don't understand ourselves, we can't lead others. We can't help others. But so often, we go around criticizing. And the words of Jesus are so important because integrity in life and leadership begins with an honest evaluation of ourself. Looking in our own eye first. Finding out what's going on inside of us if we desire others to change, then we have to be prepared to change. And the most important reality we ever live with as leaders is ourself. The hardest place to be truthful and the most important place to be truthful is ourself. But instead, we fling around criticism all the time. And Jesus says, don't do it. Spiritual growth also demands that we extend graciousness towards others. And so Jesus, in the story he tells, first of all, beginning in verse 37, makes these really simple, so simple <laughs> statements. Do not judge and you won't be judged. I think we got that one down pat, don't we? We're pretty good at that. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Okay, we, we probably have those two pretty, pretty good. Oh yeah, and forgive and you will be forgiven probably harder. 
give, and it will be given to you. And we're all pretty good givers, probably. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. What we put into the life of others is what we get back. And Jesus teaches this standard that we apply to others is the standard that will be used for us. If we are judgmental, condemning, begrudging, stingy, God says, that's the standard I'm going to use. You've got to pause and think about that. Really pause and think about that. Because Jesus doesn't throw this around lightly. That's the standard we're going to use. But if we're gracious, freeing, forgiving, generous, that's the tape measure God says he's going to use. And it gets repaid in overflowing ways. It's like taking an ice cream cone, and you've been to some of these places where you get the ice cream cone, and it's got the cone, and it's got one little scoop on the top, and the cone is empty. Once you eat the ice cream, you may as well throw it away, because unless you've got a sugar cone, you don't want to eat the cone, because it's basically cardboard. So, or you can go to the other place, you know, where they go, and they take the little things, and you start washing them, just squishing those things down, and then they pile it up, and you walk away. And every time you pile, walk away from one of those places, look how big this is. Like, I can never eat all this. We manage it, but that's what we say. <laughs> Pressed down, overflowing. One's generous, one's cheap. We know the difference in life. Jesus uses those words on purpose, saying the standard you use is the standard that will be used for you. Which are you going to be? Which will you be? And we know this. I've grown up with people, you can think years and years ago, who are cheap and stingy, they're still cheap and stingy. I still avoid going for lunch with them because they're embarrassing. You know, the people you go for lunch with, and there's a lot of Christians who do this, by the way, it's like, you know what, I'd like to teach this waiter or waitress a lesson by not giving them a tip because they're not good enough and they haven't earned their money. Or we'll leave, you know, a quarter. Cheap, stingy people. Way beyond waiters and waitresses. It's how we approach life. They also tend to be unhappy people. And Jesus says, what you put in is what you're going to get out. The measure you use is the measure that's going to be used for you. So although that applies a broad scope in life, let me focus that, Wes, on you and on the church. So easy to become judgmental. So very easy to criticize, to think, particularly when we have, start having the titles, and these titles start to mount up in the church clergy life, you're now Reverend Wes instead of Wes. You're now Pastor Wes instead of Wes. And those things start to convince us. They sell us. We start to believe what we're hearing, that we actually are Reverend. And it's, I've met you. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> so if any of you want to use irreverent rest, just use it. I'm good with that. Anyway... You, you know, you, you start to believe all that stuff, and with that comes this sense of divine right that we can start pointing at the specks in everybody else's eye because God's told us to do it, regardless of the plank on our own. We start talking about authoritarian people, and we act authoritarian when we deal with it. We become exactly the thing we say we never want to be. And we criticize, we become judgmental, we start to think that we are, and we use language from First Timothy, and I hear it in pastors all the time, we are above reproach. I really. Now, elders are to be above reproach. Does that really mean you as a person are actually, literally above reproach? In everything in your life? Really? I don't think so. Fortunately, I'll be your mentor for at least another year, and my special gift to you is keep bringing reproach. <laughs> Too easy, and for a church, it works equally the same. So easy to be judgmental, to endlessly criticize, to find what you don't like, what they should have done. Here's the truth of most pastors, most leadership teams, most boards in most churches. Now, there's the very occasional exception, but I deal with these churches and church boards every single week, almost every single day, and they care about the church they're leading. 
They love the church that they're leading. They pray for it. They worry about it. They lose sleep over it. They cry over it. They weep over it. They have anguish when there's conflict in the church. They go home and they feel sick. All of those things are true. They're trying their best to serve God with you in a church, and so are the people who are leading you, or so are are the pastors who stand up here. They are not going home and saying, oh boy, I hope I can hurt people in the church. Nobody signs up for the pastor job saying, I want to shepherd the flock of God so that I can really, really hurt them. (laughs) Doesn't happen. But the way churches act towards pastors, you'd think it did. You'd think that's what they do with their time. And they don't. And this passage applies to Wes, applies to leaders, and it applies to the church. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Remember to take the plank out of your own eye. That's true for every one of us. Second part of this, spiritually we get back what we're willing to put in. And in leadership specifically, we have to be what we desire to create. We need to be what we desire to create. And we need to think carefully about what we actually want to see happen in the lives of people that we're leading. Again, Jesus' words, he told them this parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? Student isn't above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. More often than not, we reproduce who we are. We reproduce who we are. And Jesus' words probably have the Pharisees in mind. They were religious, pious people. They knew their Bible for sure. They knew theology for sure, but they lacked generosity of spirit or practice. And it's probably why Luke brings these stories together about by the measure you use will be used for you. They were spiritual leaders in the nation, but somehow they believed that they could produce godly people without personally reflecting the actual character of God as long as they knew enough. And the follower of those two groups of people, or those people are going to end up like them, he uses one negative illustration, one positive one, negatively a blind man leading a blind man. He says, that seems like a bad idea, don't you think? And he uses a more positive one, saying students end up like their teachers, although there was some concern in this for Jesus as well. So you can find, for example, in Matthew, later in Matthew, where Jesus will talk about the Pharisees, and he will say they are blind teachers of the law. Can the blind lead the blind? He'll go on and he'll say, they travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and once they do, they make them twice as much a son of hell as they are. I'm pretty sure they liked it. I'm, I, I think they liked that. <laughs> twice as much a son of hell as you are. They become like their teacher, and it isn't attractive. At any level of leadership, we need to think through what we desire to develop. We need to take a long look at our friends, at our children, at our co-workers, at our employees, at people that we mentor in spiritual leadership. Because in the end, Jesus says, they become like their teacher. They reflect our values back to us. When we spend our life teaching people, we also learn about ourselves. That's where that honesty part starts to come in again. That's where self-awareness starts to kick in. They tell us what we believe about God, what we believe about compassion, what we believe about people, what we think about generosity or money or power or success, whatever direction that heads, we look at it and we see. Want to know what we're reflecting to others, what we're leading them in? Look at our kids and ask what have they learned from us. Look at the people around us that we lead. What have they learned from us? How has their life transformed? And it's no real surprise. We see that physically and we see that genetically that come into play, but there are spiritual genetics as well. You can usually tell who's been teaching who. You hear it in comments like, oh, it's obvious you've been hanging around this person too long. Or I can tell you've been working with. Those kind of language. We have to be what we desire to create, and it is an illusion of massive proportions massive proportions that there is any other result possible. Leadership integrity isn't simply how we react to other people. It's an issue of inner life congruence. It's what's going on in the inner man, what's going on in us. Are we telling ourselves the truth? Are we living out the generosity we claim and ask for from others? And are we doing that with the people that we're trying to lead so that they start to become like that as well? Because we can think we get away without it, and we don't. It comes back to haunt us. 
if not in the job we're doing, it does in the people who are following us. It's why when we look at elections and we see the people who are being elected, it ought to scare us to death. Because countries and people become like their leaders. It's where they learn values. And it seems like an easy concept, but it is not one practiced at most leadership levels. That's why if we talk about government leaders, which is pretty well documented, they can walk the edges of integrity with impunity, and then they're surprised when a business or a taxpayer or special interest groups violate the law. It's like, why would they be surprised? Why would they be surprised? Or when leaders and directors of our largest companies default stockholders to line their own pockets, and then they're surprised when their worker who works on the line in a factory steals something and takes extra time on their break and somehow steals money from the company. They're saying, how could they do that? Like, really? Where do you think they learned it? Or when religious leaders lie, behave immoral, egotistically self-centered about power, don't live with a generous heart, with a grace-filled heart, showering the grace that God's given to us on the people around us. And then we're surprised when churches aren't graceful back. When parents are judgmental, condemning, begrudging, greedy, and then they're aghast when our children become the same. The biggest compliments I ever get are when people meet my children and say they enjoyed them and they enjoyed their love for God. Biggest gift I ever get. R.C. Sproul in his book Objections Answer tells a story. A story you probably know. A Jewish boy who was grew up in Germany. He had a very profound admiration for his father, loved his father, idolized his father. His father was very religious, Jewish, faithfully practiced the tenets of the Jewish faith, went to synagogue regularly, regularly observed festivals, feasts, did all those things. In his teen years, the family moved to another town. It wasn't a synagogue in the other town, but there was a Lutheran church, and the life of that town revolved around the Lutheran church, obviously a very different belief system than the Jewish faith. So the father came to the family and announced that they were becoming Lutheran. They were now going to start going to the Lutheran church. Family was stunned by it. Family explained it's okay to become Lutheran because it's good for business. If we're in this town without a synagogue and we stay Jewish, we won't get the business we do if we become Lutheran. As that boy grew up, he went to England to study. He spent hours and days, in fact, in the British Museum writing a book. And in that book... He proposed that we eliminate what he called cultural and business-oriented religion. The exact term he used was opiate of the masses. And the people who followed his teaching became committed to life without God. Karl Marx, father of communism, is the person who wrote that book in England, not in the Soviet Union. In England, direct follow-through genetics of what his father had taught him what mattered, what didn't, whose roots became, became and determined his approach to life in God. Positive side is equally true. When we live with integrity, when we demonstrate graciousness, that's what people learn. I was at a, in a hospital with an older gentleman who I had the joy of pastoring with for many years, and he had had a stroke through the night, and he was brain dead. The family had to decide whether or not they were going to take him off life support. And the family was there, and great parents. On their 40th anniversary, to give an example, and this, he was a carpenter, hated being in front of people, shook like a leaf in total fear if he ever had to be in front of people. For their 40th anniversary, they invited everybody they knew from their neighborhood. They were in a walking club and various things that of people who weren't followers of Christ, invited them all to come to their anniversary. They told their kids, we'll do our own anniversary the way we want to, which was invite everybody they knew and some people from the church. And they stood up in front of them and said, you know, these are my friends. You're my friend because of this. You're my friend because of this. You're my friend because of this. I love you because of this. But we want you all to know for 40 years of marriage, it was because of Jesus. Stood up there, shared their testimony like this. <laughs> really hard for them. They made a choice to do something that they believed in. When that family was gathered and they were in that hotel or hospital room, not felt like a hotel room, when they were in there, the surgeon came in, the head of the ER at Surrey Memorial, and said to them, okay, you have to make a really difficult decision. And they said, okay, we'll do that. We'll take them off life support. 
And the surgeon said to him, well, usually there's a lot of yelling and screaming at this point. And I was in there with them at the joy of being there with them, sad joy of being there with them. And one of the kids was standing there and turned to the surgeon and said, well, my mom was explaining to me last night we were, they were reading from the book of Judges together. Well, that doesn't matter to you. But they also read from Billy Graham's book, Closer to Home. And it's just about heaven. We just believe that's closer to home. You see, in the kid, in the family, in the sons, which you saw in the parents, you cannot divorce yourself from the effect of leadership. It's every bit as positive as it is negative. It begins internally. Leadership isn't, doesn't come because we get given a position. It doesn't come because we're given a title. It's not determined by ordination. Wes, you've got ordination. It's good, but so what? You've got a title. Great. Put it on your email. <laughs> but so what? Leadership begins internally. It's where it starts. When we begin to tell ourselves the truth about ourselves, it begins when we ask ourselves how we view and treat others. It begins when we ask ourselves who we want to be, and the more we become the people God desires us to be, the more we will influence others to do the same. Character, integrity, and turtle honesty, they all precede external leadership, and it is true for every one of us because every one of us leads somewhere in some capacity. If you have a significant influence in the life of anybody, and you all do, somebody, and you want to know the kind of leadership you have, and you want to know the kind of person you are, start to look in their life. Start to look at the influence that you create. And as a leader at any level, start to ask yourself if you're going to be happy for them if they get the life you have. And start to ask yourself, Will God be happy for them if they get the life you have? You need to be what you desire to create. Thanks for the opportunity to be here with you.